The last part of this talk, we're going to explore two ways of paying attention to our intention. And one of them I think of as becoming mindful of the habitual intent that's driving us. In other words, what are the, the surface waves that are really dragging us around? Can we become aware of that? And then the second is a mindful uncovering of the deepest, most pure intention, that voice that's calling us back home. On the habitual intent side, when you're in the midst of reactivity, it's very hard to say, okay, what is my deepest, purest intention? We can't because we're getting all pulled around and there's something else going on that wants attention. So we pay attention to what's right here. We start right where we are. So for example, you're in a combative situation with another person and you've just had a email exchange or a phone call and you're all stirred up. You can't right away go to your deepest intention, but what you can do is say, okay, what's, what's my intention with this person right now? What am I wanting? What am I fearing? And you might find, oh, I'm just wanting to be, feel like that person respects me. So you, so you get that the, the immediate intention is I want respect. Okay? So that's step one. You sense what you're wanting. And then the next piece is you step out of all the thoughts about it and really feel that in your body. Feel the, the pain or the feeling of hurt that you're not respected. In other words, we be present with what is. Investigate the current intention the habitual one first. Okay, that's first practice. Now we're going to come back and do that a little bit, but I want to spend a little more time with the next level, which is when we're not stirred up, how do we begin what I consider one of the most precious practices on the path, which is reflecting regularly on our deepest intention. If each one of us that's here, each one of us that is listening, made a point of every day taking some moments to really ask ourselves, what's my deepest aspiration? What really matters to me? There would be an, a flowering in our lives that we might not have expected. What we most deeply long for is really what we are. Our longing's not for something outside us. It's like that fish that's really coming back to the water. Our longing is for the awareness and love that is what we are. And in the moments that we even sense a tendril of that, that yearning, there's a bit of homecoming right then. In fact, the, f- the sign of connecting with a pure intention is you start feeling, it's a felt sense, a shift where you start actually feeling, oh yeah, that's true, that feels true. There's a kind of come home feeling. Um, the words I most resonate for me is you feel incredibly sincere, not goppy, gunky, sincere, just feel kind of tender and real. Okay? And there's an innocence because there's, there's just nothing jaded. There's no been there, done that. It's all, you're just inhabiting more who you are. It's just a truth. You just know it and it's not conceptual. So this is a regular practice that every one of us can do and it takes a few things. One is it takes being patient because... You might notice uh, when I lead a guided meditation here, and I do it every single time, I ask you to sense your intention, your, your aspiration. When you first ask that question, if you're not settled in, you'll get a prepackaged response. <laughs> do you know what I mean? You know, it's like, okay, what I want is presence, or I want peace, or I want to relax, or I want to have my heart open. But you won't be embodying what your longing is. It takes time to settle so that we're enough awake in our bodies that we can sense our intent or aspiration and feel it in our hearts. So it takes patience. It takes asking that question and kind of dropping it in 
And then just really open, just waiting, just listening, staying in our bodies. If we stay long enough, as I mentioned, we touch into what matters in a way that we're actually touching into who we are. I like the way Ajashanti puts it. He says, all we really want in the end is to be connected once again with the truth of our being, to realize what it is that wears this mask of self. So again, you might consider the, the surface waves as the selfing waves, that they're natural, that waves are part of the ocean. I mean, we need to take care of ourselves, we need to take care of each other, our bodies, and so on. Um, and if we get fixated, we get lost in those waves, and we forget the depths, and we forget the breadth of what we belong to. So the commitment is to every day, and not just once, but I'm suggesting even start with once, to create the space to really invite, well, what really matters? And again, for those of you that are, are listening but not have, didn't do the guided practice, I spent more time with it tonight, really connecting with our aspiration, our intention. If what you connect with initially is just some words and they don't feel deep. Like, for instance, if you say, well, I want, for for me, what I usually come up with is loving awareness. What do I really want? I just want to inhabit loving awareness. I want to live from loving awareness. And often I'll say those words and I'll know they're true, but my body's not resonating with them. And that's okay. Because they are true, they still have a draw back home. So I I just want to encourage you, if it feels mechanical as you each day check in with your aspiration, it's still valuable. At other times you really will connect and it will have that sincerity. Now, one of the most powerful ways that we find that our aspiration comes alive is when we become aware of impermanence. When we sense a season is changing, we tend to be more present for the changes that are there. There's a kind of a a, a relishing or a cherishing. There's a mantra I've heard several people use uh, when they encountered their own mortality. And one, one story I'll share with you, a woman named Alana, who, when she told me she had breast cancer, my first thought was, oh, you're just too young. And her daughter had just turned two when the biopsy came back. And her first thought, of course, was, will I see her grow up? That was her first thought about her daughter. But then five years later, because we've been now, we've known each other for a while, in remission, um, she talks about the gift of the crisis, as so many people do, as something that she cherishes, but she, you know, she wouldn't trade. She didn't, wasn't seeking it, but she wouldn't trade it. And she said, I realize that what matters in my life is quality time with my loved ones. So she came down to this aspiration, I really want to be here for my loved ones. And she said, uh, and before, before the diagnosis, her, her life was, as many of ours, shaped by a very demanding career and kept her speeding around. And she always felt like the two things are, I don't have enough time and I'm letting someone down. And they were always were hitched together. But after her diagnosis, her mantra became, I have no time to rush. I have no time to rush. So this is a shift in intention. This is, rather than being dragged around by the habitual intentions, the surface waves, she dropped deeper because she realized the truth of impermanence. I have no time to rush. I mean, what if we remembered that? What would our life be like? How many moments, instead of racing through and missing the moment, 
would we live? How much more life would we have if we remembered that? So for her it meant turning the routine tasks, you know, whether it was bathing her daughter, preparing meals, shopping into together time, into these little adventures where she could delight in her daughter's laugh and see the glow in her eyes and her curiosity and she could listen more to her husband who was a journalist as he talked about his day because the moments mattered. So I share this with you and I remember when she told me, she was, I still don't know how long I, I'm going to live, but she said, I'm not going to land up with my daughter going to college and feeling like, oh, it all just flashed by. Where did that time go? I'm living my moments. So we get the same transmission, I think, from all the spiritual traditions, in a way, which is really, don't wait for the diagnosis. Don't wait. You can live very deeply if you want. You can touch into what matters and have your life align with it. I remember sharing with you all the um, the palliative care nurse who described it that how many people, when they're dying, their deepest regret is that they didn't live true to themselves. She said, that's the deepest regret the dying people have, not living true to themselves. They did not, rather than listening to the depths, to what really matters, felt like they got tugged around by their own expectations of themselves and others' expectations of them. You know, the surface waves. So the teaching is not to wait, to begin this reflection now of what really matters. I think one of the main arenas that it seems so poignant is with with each other. I mean, how many times, even with the people, the dearest to us, are we either, you know, doing parallel playing or just missing each other because we're preoccupied? You know, how rare is it a really, really connecting? I remember in my, the first retreat I ever did with Thich Nhat Hanh, the closing ritual, and I've, I've shared this with some of you before, where he had us look at each other and say namaste, which is I see the divine in you. And then he had us hug each other, and with the first breath we reflected, I'm going to die. With the second breath, you're going to die. And then with the third, and we have just these moments together. Can you sense how full these moments become? How much we're contacting what matters when we let the truth of, hey, it's really passing. Hmm. Let's just practice a bit. We'll we'll do a couple, just two meditations tonight together, and then we'll close. So the beginning of knowing if you want to touch what really matters, come into your body. You might, as you close your eyes, just let your awareness really sweep through your body. Know that you're here. Feel your breath. And you might sense the breath at the heart so that as you breathe in you feel whatever the experience of your heart is. Breathing in and out of your heart.
You might imagine that you're almost at the end of your life. You have a few days left. You're able to, but you're able to move around, do things, be with people. What would be most important? What would be most important about how you spent those days? Now come even closer and sense you just have a few minutes left. What's important about these minutes? What do you want to be paying attention to? How do you want to pay attention? What do you want to trust or experience or know? This is your aspiration. If you're at the end of your life and looking back, what do you want to see about how you lived your life? bringing to mind perhaps a person that you care about dearly. Take some moments now to imagine yourself with that person, somebody you see regularly that matters to you. And explore this ritual that Thich Nhat Hanh teaches, you might imagine bowing and just looking into that person's eyes and sensing the sacredness, sensing the mystery that's looking out at you that's the same mystery in you looking at that person. Just sensing awareness, consciousness. You might sense that hug that I described where you reflect, I'm going to die. You're going to die. We have just these moments. Sense what matters. Sense your heart's aspiration right now, what you care about. Sometimes you hear a voice through the door calling you as a fish out of water hears the surf's Come back. This turn toward what you deeply love saves you.
Just closing with the metta, our loving kindness prayer, that all beings everywhere might remember to listen, to come home to presence, to recognize their heart's aspiration and allow that to carry them to freedom. May all beings awaken. May all beings heal. May all beings be free. Namaste.